In this video, we continue our discussion of using spectral data to determine the complete structures of organic molecules by focusing on the key features of an infrared spectrum or an IR spectrum for short. By the end of this video, you will have an understanding of what is meant by the axes of the example spectrum that we see here and how to interpret some of the signals from this spectrum. So let's dive into taking a look at some key information from an IR spectrum. And what I'm going to do here is just sketch out a generic IR spectrum, drawing attention to the axes of the spectrum that you will see. Generally, the x-axis is shown as wave numbers. And a wave number is defined in units of inverse centimeters, so centimeters to the negative one. And what the wave number equals is the wave number is equal to one over the wavelength at which the absorption of energy occurs. So the wave number is equal to one over the wavelength here, where the wavelength is measured in centimeters. Hence the units that we see for wave number are inverse centimeters since it's one over that wavelength in centimeters. The general range of the IR spectrum is from approximately 600 wave numbers to 4,000 wave numbers. So I'm gonna put those at my ends of the axis here. I'm also gonna go ahead and draw in my Y axis which is generally listed in units of transmittance. And those can be absolute units where you would have numerical values at the bottom and top here. It can also be expressed commonly as a percent transmittance where whatever the highest largest value is, is normalized to 100% and the lowest value of no transmittance is listed as 0%. So what the transmittance is referring to is the extent to which IR energy is absorbed. So the percent transmittance we can think of as the energy that is absorbed within that infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So IR energy absorbed. And remember, that what the exact wave number at which this IR energy absorption is occurring and the extent to which the transmittance is happening is dependent upon the fact that specific molecular bonds within functional groups will absorb IR radiation at only certain wavelengths. And hence, that generates the IR spectrum. And that IR spectrum is gonna to correspond to that absorption of electromagnetic radiation within the infrared region. And so what results is a IR spectrum that is indicative of the functional groups that are present within the molecule. So I'm just going to sketch out here some signals that we could see within an IR spectrum, just kind of sketching along the pathway here. all the way over. And within this IR spectrum, these signals that we're seeing, these particular valleys are signals of interest or note. And along that x-axis, there are a couple of regions that I should bring to your attention. One is that between 600 and 1400, wave numbers, we refer to as the fingerprint region. The fingerprint region of the spectrum is an area where you'll generally see lots and lots of different signals. And the fingerprint region is useful, much like your fingerprint, in identifying you. So if you have another molecule that is identical to the one that you have collected the IR spectrum from, the fingerprint region of those two compounds, since they're identical, should also be identical. Other than that, the fingerprint region is not particularly useful in determining the structure of a complete unknown. So if you're looking at a molecule that has never before been isolated, 
and you're trying to determine its chemical structure, the fingerprint region is not going to be particularly useful. It is useful in cases where you have some authentic standard of that compound and you're comparing your unknown to that authentic standard. And if the fingerprints match, then it means the two compounds samples are the same. So we call this the fingerprint region. And generally speaking, for purposes of this class and most applications where you won't have access to a standard of the compound of interest, the fingerprint region is not particularly valuable. Um, it's only going to be if you can exactly match with some other spectrum that it will indicate that two compounds are the same. It's not generally useful for a new molecule where you don't have a standard available. Instead, when you're working with a compound where you do not know the structure of the compound and you have no standard to compare it to, instead this other region is going to be considerably more useful. And that other region we generally think of as extending from about 1600 wave numbers onward to about 4,000. And this region from 1600 onward is the region that is most diagnostic of specific functional groups. So I'm gonna label this as diagnostic of specific functional groups. Because generally what IR is useful for is identifying what specific functional groups are present within a molecule? In other words, is there an alcohol, alcohol functional group present? Is there a aldehyde group present or a ketone group present or whatever else the case might be? So this would be a good time, by the way, if you are feeling a little shaky on your functional groups to go back and review them. Those are found in chapter two of the Wade textbook. So within an IR spectrum, how do we go about matching up the particular wave number signals that we see, in other words, the particular minima of the spectrum here, with specific functional groups in this region that is diagnostic of specific functional groups. How do we go about matching those specific functional groups up with the exact wave number? Well, fortunately, there are tables of empirically determined values that correspond to different functional groups, such as table 12.2 from your textbook and also available in the package of handout information that corresponds to this IR module. So we're going to take a look at that. So here's that table of IR stretching frequencies. You'll notice that these span from that region of about 1600 wave numbers up to about 3300 wave numbers indicating which key functional groups will exhibit frequencies within that region of wave numbers here. So some key ones that you should be aware of that are very, very diagnostic and useful for solving the structures of organic molecules by determining what functional groups are in them are the carbonyl groups are extremely useful. Specifically, we can look at ketones, aldehydes, esters, and amides as examples. And each of those will show up at approximately a specific wave number here. And keep in mind that these are all ranges that are around that number. The other thing that you should be aware of about the carbonyl group signal is that it's very strong, meaning that that's going to be a very deep signal that stretches downward almost toward the baseline. In many cases, it's almost the strongest, if not the strongest signal in the spectrum, meaning that's a very deep signal that extends far down toward the baseline. So carbonyls are a key functional group that you can identify using IR. So you could distinguish within a molecule about whether you had a carbonyl functional group or not by looking for a signal that is in that 1700 approximate region of the spectrum and perhaps narrow down even more what type of functional group that carbonyl is associated with by looking a bit deeper in these individual ranges. Another signal that is very useful that sticks out uh, predominantly is the alcohol functional group. The alcohol functional group appears at approximately 3300, so I'm gonna put the approximate symbol there. And the key way to recognize an alcohol symbol is that it is always very broad. Some people would describe it as tongue-like. So like a tongue sticking out. 
such as I have drawn here. You could envision this as a tongue or something of that sort. So it is always going to be very broad. Keep in mind there are other signals that show up at around that same region, but they will not be broad. The alkane group, for example, shows up at 3000. Practically everything you run into is going to have this because alkane just implies there's some carbon-carbon single bonds in there. That's also at approximately 3000, but it is not going to be broad. Instead, the broadness of that signal is going to be similar to the other signals that you see within the spectrum. The alcohol signal will be notably more broad, more tongue-like than the other signals in the spectrum. So you will want to be comfortable with interpreting the information from this table. It would also be a great idea to keep this table handy when you do things like take the first quiz or complete the first project where you'll be using spectroscopy in those assignments. Um, I would definitely not recommend memorizing this table. That's pretty unnecessary. Instead, you will always, if you're working as a chemist, have access to this type of information. So it's most important to be able to rapidly interpret these values in order to use them to determine the functional groups that are present within a particular molecule. So let's take a look at what we mean by that. So here I've dropped in spectra for three different compounds for us to look at and evaluate to illustrate how the values that we observe within these IR spectra correspond to the expected IR stretching frequencies so that we can get a handle on interpreting these data with our ultimate goal of being able to take an IR spectrum for a complete unknown and use that as one of our pieces of information for solving the structure of that particular organic molecule in combination with mass spectrometry and NMR. So looking at the spectrum that is at the top here, what I want to bring to your attention is we mentioned how the carbonyl signals are really valuable because they are generally very easy to spot because they show up around 1700 wave numbers along the x-axis here, and they are typically the strongest or one of the strongest signals within the spectrum. And you can see that is the case here for the signal I'm putting the star next to there in green in your upper left-hand corner. And we can see this signal is at 1718 wave number, which is very much in alignment with the expected value for a ketone, where the signal at 1718 is about halfway in between our aldehyde and ketone here, keep in mind these values are approximate, making it correspond to a ketone as one possibility here. And that is actually what this corresponds to because the actual compound is heptin to own this ketone with seven carbons and the ketone group at carbon number two of the chain. The other thing I wanna to bring to your attention is over here at about 3000, we see our signal for a saturated CH bond. A saturated CH bond, remember saturated means that it is an alkane. So that corresponds to our alkane signal here, which is generally a signal that is around 3000. It is not a broad signal. So that's why you see that the depth of these signals is very similar to the, the, um, width that we see for the other signal here. So keep that in mind as well. In contrast, if we come down here to hexanoic acid, hexanoic acid having a carboxylic acid. So remember that has the COOH group there, which is a special kind of hydroxy group. What we are going to see is that in that particular compound, we do have a hydroxy group stretching signal there that is a very broad signal, so very wide in other words. And that corresponds, if we look over at our chart of IR stretching frequencies, we see acid hydroxy group, that is carboxylic acids, are very broad and they show up at around 3000. So the way that we can distinguish between the fact that this is a carboxylic acid signal that we're seeing here and not just a saturated CH stretch is that although both show up at around 3000, the OH stretch, regardless of whether it's part of an alcohol or part of a carboxylic acid, is very, very broad. Um, we do also see superposed with that these CH stretch signals, and that's why rather than this being just shaped like a tongue and smooth at the bottom, you also see these additional fangs hanging off of it, these additional dips hanging off of it, which are the CH stretching signals superposed there because we have absorption of 
radiation for the CH bonds at the same range as we see the hydroxy group stretching occurring there. So keep in mind that for carboxylic acids, the hydroxy group is going to give a broad signal. For alcohols, the hydroxy group is also going to give a very broad signal that is tongue-like with possibly some extra dips here if it overlaps with the range of the alkane stretching frequencies going on here. In this spectrum for hexanoic acid, since there is also a carbonyl group present in the carboxylic acid group, as I've circled there in the middle bottom of your screen, we also see the carbonyl group showing up here. And in this case, the carbonyl group is showing up at 1711 is what it's labeled as. And that is going to be in agreement with the expected range of a carbonyl signal. And here in our chart, you'll notice the chart is not completely comprehensive for all the functional groups because this is carbonyl, which we definitely have, but it doesn't specify in this list further to the right that I'm highlighting with my laser pointer, it doesn't specify carboxylic acid in this list, um, but carboxylic acid, since they do contain a carbonyl, are gonna fall somewhere in that range still. So you see this very strong signal that shows up at around 1700 for that. Likewise, in butyraldehyde, that's our four carbon aldehyde molecule shown up here, you also see that very strong, prominent signal, in this case it's 1724, which corresponds very nicely to the expected aldehyde signal at 1725 approximately in the summary of stretching regions. Um, we furthermore do see the CH stretching frequencies over here within the spectrum. And that's super common, not only in these three examples that we've looked at here, but just across the board, most organic molecules are gonna have some saturated CH stretching because most organic molecules have at least one carbon-carbon single bond with some hydrogens attached to it. So keep these things in mind. But in general, what we are going to see is that the most diagnostic signals that we can use in IR are going to be for alcohols, and carboxylic acids with the hydroxy group showing up very broadly, and the carbonyl groups showing up at around 1700. Those are going to be very key signals that are very strong and diagnostic. Some of the other signals, the ones that we haven't highlighted here, you can also use to some extent to determine the structures of organic molecules, but there's a lot of overlap of different signals in those regions, and those signals are not particularly diagnostic based on their um, strength or the broadness of the signal. And so those are a bit harder to pick apart and can sometimes lead you astray. But the carbonyl signals and the hydroxy group signals are very strong diagnostic features to help in identifying what functional groups are present in a molecule. So in the next video, what we'll do is take this a step further and answer some practice problems related to using IR spectroscopy.